Good morning, everyone. My name is Rima Izquierdo, and we'll get started in just a few minutes while we give people a moment to get situated. So if you need anything, please do so now. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. I also want to be sure to announce that this presentation is available with automatic closed captioning. Hoy y siempre brindamos servicios de interpretación simultánea para nuestros eventos igual en persona o en Zoom. Favor de hacer clic en el globo al fondo de su pantalla donde dice interpretación. Luego haga clic en el idioma que desea escuchar, en este caso español. Si quiere escuchar solo al intérprete, puede también hacer clic en Mute Original Audio que silenciará el audio original. Muchísimas gracias y de nuevo, bienvenidos a Sinergia. Estamos agradecidos en tenerlos aquí. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that we are broadcasting today's event live via our Facebook page and want to give a warm welcome to those joining us there. A few housekeeping notes. Everyone who's registered via Zoom will receive a copy of the presentation slides via a follow-up email within the next few days. A survey will be shared via link at the end of this presentation. We will have time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. We encourage questions at any time However, please remember this is a public forum and we are being broadcast on Facebook. My name is Rima Izquierdo and I am the trainer here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. A few words about Synergia's Autism Initiative. The Autism Initiative Project is funded by a grant from the New York City Council under its Autism Initiative. This project supplements the work of Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center by bringing increased awareness to New York City residents, particularly to the communities with large Spanish-speaking populations, about the growing number of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Its strong outreach component targets families of children with a suspected or known diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder who are not receiving appropriate educational, health, and other related services. The initiative will link them to other services and supports that meet the individual needs of children and their families. I want to thank you all for joining us. We are glad you chose to be with us today. Before we get to it, I'd like to introduce our presenters. I want to welcome Marie Runfala, doctoral candidate in School of Psychology, Edie Kramer, master student in School of Counseling Program, and Tara Coffey, master studying in School of Counseling Program, all from Fordham University. So glad you could join us today. And we have so many questions, so we'll let you get to it. For those of you joining us, after the presenter concludes their presentation, we will have a question and answer session. If you're joining us on Facebook Live and you have questions, please place them in the comments section and we'll be sure to ask. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We will be presenting today on anger management for teenagers. And we know that we have a lot of parents and teachers that might be joining. Um, so this will be geared towards giving you more information there. So we are coming from Fordham University and I am part of an organization called Clinical Mental Health Services in the Bronx community. We provide free virtual counseling sessions to children and adolescents who live or attend school in the Bronx, and clients can receive therapy in either English or Spanish at no cost. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, um, parents can contact us, school staff can refer, um, and we'd be happy to get children set up with services. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Marie, and I have a strong interest in social emotional learning and caregiver child relationships. So this topic of anger management um, is directly related to those relationships too, and um, hopefully the information provided will increase some understanding. Um, Edie. Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, like my colleague Marie and Tara, I also have a strong interest in emotion regulation. So I'm very excited to bring these insights to you all and thank you for joining us today. 
morning, everyone. I'm going to be your third presenter today. My name's Tara Coffey, uh, similar to Edie. I'm in the School Counseling Program at Fordham, um, and also similar to both my fellow presenters, very interested in emotional regulation and making sure that our kids can get through the day the way they need to, um, and for me at least, focus on their education as much as possible. So today we will discuss what anger is, why we get angry, responses to anger, managing anger, resources, and then have time for some questions. Uh, throughout the presentation, we will refer to teens and the adults in their lives, parents and teachers, as caregivers and skill teachers. Parents and teachers have the responsibility of reflecting on our own anger management skills in order to effectively teach and model skill development and use for teenagers. And while we all know that managing anger and other intense emotions is important, sometimes it's easier said than done. So what is anger? Um, it's a basic human emotion, and what we know about it is that those emotions are trying to tell us something. So it's a normal feeling, and everyone feels angry sometimes. What we're going to talk about today is how we can help ourselves and teens to recognize and manage anger. Um, and what really counts is how we handle it. Um, so if you are interested in participating, we're so curious about your thoughts, you can scan the code or go to menti.com um, and enter that code. And you'll be able to see on your screen some of the responses. Um, and that's something that we can also share at the end. Okay. So we really appreciate that you do share because we think that you know your environments best. Um, feeling anger might be in reaction to environmental stressors when we're denied our wants or we lose something, demands of time or performance, or a reaction to experiencing other people's behaviors, attitudes, or beliefs. Anger can also be in reaction to someone or yourself being hurt or threatened, you being interrupted, or when a goal is blocked. So when we think about anger, there's one thing that we as presenters and as individuals navigating this emotion think is very important to challenge. Um, it's what we're calling the big lie about anger. And that is that it's not true that frustrating people, places, or events make us behave angrily. Rather, we as individuals are always responsible for angry behavior in reaction to frustration. And so while it's you know perfectly normal and usual that our first response towards frustrating people, places, and events may be anger, we can also choose to behave in other ways. And we can ultimately help ourselves and teens take responsibility for their emotions and behaviors by learning and practicing the skills to do so. Next slide, please. So again, this is a fabulous goal, but we need to know a little bit more about our anger responses and our reactions. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what that might look like from the physical perspective. So what happens to our bodies when we become angry? Um, we can experience many physical changes in our body. For example, our brains begin to release chemicals that give us bursts of energy. Um, that's probably why when we're angry, we feel like that sensation that we're about to explode. That's our body signaling to us that something's going on. Um, other physical changes might be our heart rate, blood pressure, or even our breathing increases. We might get hot, our temperature sort of jumps up, and I'm sure some of us begin to sweat when we feel angry. All of these experiences, the physical sensations that we feel, are an indication that we might be angry. And this is helpful to take notice of 
when we're going through this emotion. Next slide, please. So we can feel these physical sensations and we can start to understand our anger responses and reactions, but we can also ask ourselves in the moment, you know, is this anger bad? And that really demands that we ask ourselves the larger question, is all anger bad? And the answer is no. Um, anger can be good and it can certainly be a problem. But on the good side, anger can help us when we feel threatened. It gets us moving. It gets our body telling us that, you know, maybe something's not right. It can push us to change a situation or speak up for ourselves. Ultimately, it tells us that, you know, anger is a normal feeling and everyone feels angry sometimes. But on the other end of that, feeling angry all the time can cause us some problems. Um, anger can be problematic when it's maybe the first thing we feel when we wake up or when we act out in anger through behavior like yelling at a friend, a child, or a parent we can ultimately end up hurting ourselves and others. So much like a few slides ago, we have another mentee code that we would love for you to either scan or plug in the use code that you see on your slide and share with us your thoughts on a time when you experienced good anger or when anger might've helped you or your child or student. I think sometimes we don't understand the, the good ways anger can help us, and it's important to recognize those moments in addition to when anger might be doing us harm. So we'll give you a moment to plug that code in, and then we can reflect on that at the end of the presentation. The slide may be experiencing a disruption, and if that occurs, we'll reflect as a group. So we can continue exploring, you know, how, what happens to us when we're, when we're feeling angry. And we wanted to further this conversation by exploring what happens to our brains and minds when we're angry. Um, on this slide, you see both cognitive and emotional signs of anger, but really what these tell us is that we might find ourselves unable to make decisions feeling confused, unable to concentrate or remember properly, or we might even become too focused on specific things. On the emotional side, so the right side of your screen, um, we, we might also become more irritable, suspicious, maybe fearful of others. Um, we also might feel sadness and hopelessness, probably even helplessness. So these are all signs that we might be feeling anger. They can be both cognitive, what's going on in your mind, or emotional, something that I like to think, you know, what's going on in your heart or the feelings that take over your body. Next slide, please. Other visible signs to look out for that might indicate anger include things like starting arguments with others, Increasing behaviors like smoking or drinking, even more episodes of crying or breaking things, ways that make you really, you know, feel as if you're releasing these emotions. Um, there are also some not so obvious signs, things that are a bit more covert, and that might be passive aggressiveness, excluding people, even drawing yourself away from others, withdrawing. Um, physical problems can also be manifestations of anger, things like headaches, stomach problems, or even back pain. So from these slides, you really see that anger expressions can come in a variety of different ways. And it's helpful for us to know sort of the broad spectrum so we can help ourselves, our students, and our children also begin to feel more confident recognizing those as they go through their lives. Next slide. So this is sort of a larger, more comprehensive list of signs that show feeling angry might be concerning. And, and really, if you notice these signs, you, your student or your child may need help. Um, things like when you hold, hold in anger, 
excuse me, when you hold in anger, it can make you feel badly about yourself and other people. Um, if you hold it in long enough, you might even start to feel sick. So we see a spectrum of what holding in anger can really do to oneself. Um, threatening to hurt other people or damage their things, that's another sign to look out for. Starting fights or following through on hurting others. Um, things like anger lasting a long time or you feeling scared of your own anger is another signal to maybe the more extreme end, having problems with the law um, or having those interpersonal problems that really manifest, manifest into larger situations. These are all signs that your anger, it might be time to find support or reach out for someone to help you, your child or your student. So we've spent a lot of time talking about what is anger and how can we recognize it? But there's also a lot of knowledge to be known about how we can manage anger, because the wonderful thing is that we certainly can, and our anger isn't too far beyond us that we can't do anything. So really the question is, well, how can anger be managed? Um, and we broke this next section up into three sections. We will review something called preventative skills that includes increasing awareness, problem solving, We'll review something called crisis survival skills. And then we'll also talk a bit more about something called cognitive restructuring. But we'll first begin with preventative skills, something that we're really focusing in on increasing awareness and self-awareness. So Marie, if you could hit the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, one preventative skill is to increase self-awareness and self-control. But, you know, what does that really mean? Um, the first step is ultimately to notice the emotion that one is feeling in that moment, for example, anger. Then we challenge ourselves to consider, why am I feeling this anger? Is there a threat? Is this anger necessary in the moment? It could certainly be that way. Is there not a threat? Is this maybe an anger expression that I want to reflect on and understand and increase my personal self-control and awareness, that could certainly be the situation. But the main red thread underneath all of this is that we're thinking about this emotion before we let it sort of run through our mind and through our actions. We're thinking before we act. We're ultimately trying to hit a pause button in our mind. But sometimes a pause is not enough for adults or teenagers. Thinking in that moment, we might not be there with ourselves, and that's perfectly okay. A pause can grow into something that's a little bit bigger, maybe a bit more physical, like walking away, taking a break, giving yourself actual space to cool down and reflect. That's a pause. It's a little bit different, but it's a pause, and it's just as important to our self-awareness and self-control to be able to take that break, use that break to remove ourselves from the situation that's causing us anger and to think before we act. So another preventative strategy that we find very important in our field is something called mindfulness. And I think mindfulness, it's a word that you know, can be heard through a variety of different situations. And we might ask ourselves, you know, why might someone want to practice mindfulness? Ultimately, it's another tool that gives us more choices and that control over our behavior. It helps people slow down, notice their emotions, their thoughts, and their urges, and begin that, you know, experience of processing and understanding where this feeling is coming from and what comes next. So for example, often when someone feels angry, there's an urge to do something about it. By pausing and taking time to observe or notice, incorporating that mindfulness into our processing, it's possible for us to be more in control and able to choose the behaviors that follow. So to give you another example, instead of maybe yelling in response to anger, pausing allows us the choice to walk away 
take a deep breath, maybe ask for help instead of yelling. Um, this can ultimately improve our health by reducing emotional suffering, pain, and stress, and just allow us to work in that time to really recenter ourselves, give ourselves that pause that we were talking about a few slides ago. Mindfulness can ultimately help us in the long road as well. We can increase those wanted emotions and well-being that we, that we might want in our lives. Um, we can think about how problematic anger can negatively, negatively impact our lives and then work to incorporate those emotions that lift us up and help us feel more control. And that's wonderful. I think that's all we want as humans. So when we're not looking at situations through a lens of anger, when we're allowing ourselves that space to incorporate mindfulness, it can ultimately increase the compassion for ourselves and for others. So the final slide on mindfulness, and this is just an example of, of how we might you know, teach mindfulness to our children or our students. It's something we're breaking up into essentially the idea that we want to be in control of our mind rather than letting it be in control of you. So how do we do that? If we can incorporate a little bit more of what we're calling full awareness or being aware of the present moment, things like emotions, physical sensations, or thoughts without judgment or trying to change it, we can ultimately allow ourselves to understand what we're feeling implement our strategy that maybe tells us to walk away for a moment or take a breath and then come back and act the way that we feel is a bit healthier for ourselves, our students, our peers, our children, for everyone involved. Um, so if we're able to balance this full awareness and incorporate it more, then we can lead ourselves on a mindfulness path that ultimately makes us healthier individuals and people of our community. So now I'll pass it to my colleague, Tara. Great. Thank you, Edie. All right, um, so now we're gonna talk about some preventative problem solving. Um, so sometimes the feeling of anger is justified. Anger can be a really healthy and natural response to problems and to difficulties. And when someone is angry, they're usually looking for a solution. Sometimes there's no solution, and sometimes that solution doesn't come right away. So instead, we want to focus on how to handle and face the problem in the moment. For example, walking away when you feel like you can't control your anger or asking for help if there's not a clear solution Making a plan and checking progress along the way can help handling and resolving anger and ultimately make it easier. The act of self-monitoring really allows for an increased awareness um, in that moment and also in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So next we're gonna talk about handling impulsivity or crisis urges. So when someone is feeling anger so intensely, they might act on urges before even thinking about the consequences. This can be common for teens and sometimes happens with parents and teachers, many adults. So here's an example of how we can prepare for our impulsivity or help teens to do the same thing. First, we wanna recognize the impulsive behaviors that are felt when we're angry, something like yelling. And next, we want to write out the pros and the cons of that impulsive behavior. So for example, a pro is that you're able to release your anger. But one of the cons is that you might hurt the person that you're yelling at. Once we've done that, we want to, um, oh, sorry. Once we've done that, you want to write out, uh, or you want to carry the list with you. So for teens, this can be something like carrying that list in their school agenda for adults that might be using a notes app on your phone. And then the next time that that overwhelming urge to yell at someone is felt, you can really quickly review the pros and cons list. You can really quickly pull it up for yourself. 
And you want to imagine the positive effects of resisting that urge, so resisting yelling, but you also want to imagine the negative consequences if you engage in that, and that can be a really powerful tool. Uh, next slide, please. So another technique that we can use for crisis urges is something called self-soothing. It's something we do with the six senses. So you can look, hear, taste, touch, and smell something pleasant or soothing to your senses. This can be watching a comedy show, eating a sweet, smelling a soothing aroma, something like lavender. You can also use movement to soothe yourself. So something like stretching your body, or as we've mentioned before, going on a brief walk, walking away from the situation. Uh, all right, next slide, please. And then the final slide we're gonna talk about or skills we're gonna talk about is uh, the acronym TIP. So these are more techniques that you can use when you're experiencing those crisis urges. The acronym TIP makes it easier to remember. So a child may need help to determine which is the safest, especially considering their ability level or the circumstances they're in, what's appropriate at school. Um, so the first one is going to be temperature. An example of this is you can shock your body and distract it from the really intense feelings by splashing your face with cold water, or you can run your wrists under a cold tap. And then the next is that you can use your energy by engaging in an intense exercise. Um, these intense exercises really raise your heart rate. You can also calm your heart rate by paced breathing. So practicing that paced breathing. And then last, you can also tense and relax your muscles to assist in recognizing how to calm your body down. So these are all skills that can really help with our anger management. I'm gonna go over some additional skills in the next slide. So the last technique we're gonna review is what's called cognitive restructuring. This allows us to change our thoughts and how we interpret the world around us. And we're gonna be specifically talking about thoughts around anger. So you can avoid using extreme words like never, always, and should. Often these words place really inflexible rules on us and others when they're inevitably broken, we tend to become angry. Um, so we really wanna pause before anger gets too extreme. We wanna rationalize and logically work through that anger. So we can ask ourselves questions like, who or what is making you angry? What's an appropriate solution based on the pros and the cons? What is it that you need and that you don't yet have? So developing these skills can really have the power to change the way you think and experience the world around you. Uh, next slide, please. So we can help ourselves or teenagers reduce and manage their anger by either changing the environment to reduce the chances that you or your child become angry, learning how to better communicate the feelings and desires through self-advocacy, building positive healthy habits. This can be things like prioritizing your sleep, healthy eating, exercise, stretching. We can also do things like avoiding caffeine and alcohol and drugs. These are all substances that can affect our anger and even make our anger feel more intense, or they can even make us more impulsive to do those inappropriate actions that might come about when we're angry. And lastly, you just really wanna make sure you're utilizing your support system. So you wanna reach out and talk to others and focus on building fun hobbies to really help you de-stress. And that's something you can do with your support system. All right. So we're just gonna revisit some key points from our presentation. We really wanna remember that anger is a basic human emotion. It's something that we all feel and it's not a bad thing to feel it. Anger can uh, anger responses can really manifest in cognitive, emotional, and behavioral reactions. But we do want to make sure that we manage our anger when possible, and that is possible. So ways we can manage our anger is through those preventative skills, some crisis survival skills, and that cognitive restructuring. 
So just as a reminder, practicing and teaching these healthy ways to manage anger can really help people feel more in control of themselves, in control of the situation, and in control of their emotions. All right, and then these next two slides just have some resources for you guys. These slides are going to be shared at the end of the presentation, um, so you'll be able to click through those resources. All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And we do invite any parents or teachers to refer students or their children if needed. Um, you can simply send us an email with your basic information and a member of our team will reach out. We can provide short-term counseling um, at no cost. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and hope this information was useful and might spark conversations um, with you, your children, your students. Um, any questions or comments, now is a great time and we will answer any and we welcome any feedback um, via the link regarding our presentation or its content. Rima, do we have any sessions? I can't hear you. Ap apologies. So as we mentioned earlier, we will now be opening the floor for Q&A with our presenters. Please make sure to write all your questions in the Q&A and the chat. Um, I did briefly look over into Facebook and I don't see questions there. Um, and there was a question here, but it was about the connectivity. So I, I, I didn't see a question on this platform. Um, do you happen to know if we had pre-registration questions? I just shared them with you, Fima. Fantastic. All right. So will you be sharing tools for teenagers with autism who are in transition? So those are definitely some resources that if, if people are interested in, we can send along. Um, in in regards to those those specific um, circumstances, yes, we can we can share some resources. Okay, fantastic. Um, another question is, how can I understand why my child is so angry? Sure, yes. And um, ED or Tara, feel free to jump in. But in terms of understanding, you know, why or how children are so angry, um, really taking the time to notice as a parent what's happening before they get angry, um, what's going on in the environment. Um, and it's it's good to to initiate some of those conversations. And if conversation is not available um, ability wise to the child paying attention to the environment and and what's happening um, in terms of you know is the environment really loud or is it overstimulating are there a lot of things going on um, and sometimes too that anger could be a function of communication I think sometimes kids are trying to get their needs met but but they don't know how um, so we see that Anything to add, Edie or Tara? All right, so next question. Um, will you be sharing information about ways to work with teens who have autism and are learning about their disability? So maybe about disclosure. Sure, okay. Yeah, and that's... a you know, a little related to the other question about resources. So, um, I'm sorry, Rima is, so is the question about. So they're asking if there's information to be shared, um, but specifically 
teens that have autism and are learning about their disability. So I'm I'm sure. reading okay. it as like maybe just have disclosed or are like in the process of disclosure and um tools to help them with and and I'm guessing right in the theme that they may not like the the diagnosis right or or hearing about having that I think it's it's that like just how do how do you ha- how do you cope or do you have tools or information to help families help students cope with learning about them having a disability and and about the disability itself sure thank you so much and yeah i mean it's it's a lot of like identifying those emotions and validating that they're okay and it's okay to feel angry um or confused or having big emotions about a change in information that you've learned or um taking the time to understand more about yourself um so yes that is that is information that we can pass along also when we when we send our slides and um i apologize that our presentation didn't have more information about those questions um thank you uh how do hormonal changes affect the child or adolescent's behavior yeah <laughs> hormones especially as children are are moving into the teenage years can cause some of those emotions to feel a lot bigger um and can also affect their ability to regulate their emotions um and understand really what they are and i i think sometimes teenagers um as they're coming into um those kind of hormonal changes they are but they might even be surprised by their own emotions um terror ed yes the the answer is definitely there is influence from our hormones going on um like a lot of the you know physical signs of anger that we talked about the you know temperature changing our heartbeat feeling like it's going through the roof these are all you know ways that our body is responding and sending chemicals throughout and that's really the same process when we're either going through puberty or experiencing a, a major hormonal change and i think while we we can't change the the biology of humans it is something that just happens what we can do is introduce naming of those emotions, working on reflecting on those emotions, understanding that they're coming right now and exploring what what might have happened that made us cause this feeling or or feel this anger or anger or sadness or whatever it might be. Um, because the reality is our bodies do change and we have hormonal processes that will happen without us being able to say, no, stop. But what we can work on is practicing those behaviors that allow us to feel more in control of those emotions that that come to life as we're growing up and entering new phases of our life. And I think a really good place to start, too, is um, for yourself or your child, um, really thinking about being aware of those things. So a a child isn't going to be able to just automatically self-regulate. They need to start to know those body signs to be able to understand that something is happening. And and those body signs, um, such as, you know, your heartbeat, raising your palms, sweating, things to that nature, tell us that we need to make a change or notice so we can choose what to do next. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A. I have a 14-year-old son with autism, and we're going through some changes. How can we support him with the behaviors typical of this age? I think um, one place you can start is acknowledging the behaviors with your child. So that means I think working through them together as maybe a family unit or as a collaborative um, support unit. And then if it's appropriate, addressing them and guiding them towards maybe more positive behaviors that um, help your child feel more settled or aware of their emotions. And then ultimately leading it more towards that self mindfulness and confidence in being able to understand this emotion is going through my mind. 
How do I feel more confident in being able to maybe settle myself or take a break or take a pause? Um, I don't think it happens overnight, which can be very frustrating, but working together and guiding your child as a unit can really help with these changes that you're facing and come come to you. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think taking time to model the use of emotional language can be really powerful, um, especially in the teenage years. We're not like all used to talking about naming how situations make us feel. But once you're acknowledging those feelings that you might be having too as a parent, um, you're modeling the use of that emotional language that helps kids to get their needs met. Um, so for example, you know, if you're really frustrated, you can say, you know, wow, I'm, I'm feeling really frustrated because we're running late and there's a ton of traffic. Um, and that is, that's modeling for when kids might have difficult situations with peers or at school. And it's showing them too, that you approve and accept and are validating that they're having these emotions. And when, when that emotional conversation is reciprocal, um, it can make students and children feel really empowered to share how they're feeling, to get their needs met and self-advocate. Thank you. Um, we have another question. One moment. Um, Tips on ways to work with teens diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and learning about their disability. All right, so same thing. And then um, tips for bursting anger and personality change. For example, being happy and understanding one moment to cruel and angry. Yeah, I, th I, think, I, I think that one goes back to, to that emotional identification um, and understanding what's going on in the environment before those big feelings happen. Um, and as Edie said, some of those things are rooted in our biology and hormonal changes. Um, and knowing that sometimes there's not an answer to that. And as a parent, that's okay. And there isn't always this like quick fix or quick solution, but the practice of skills like mindfulness, noticing what's happening um, before, during, after, and noticing what helps, what what's calming children down, what's providing them with comfort um, in a safe way, and how can we give them tools to express themselves better, like modeling emotional language. Yeah, I agree with Maria, and I think if I could just add the as we talked about it the power of a pause it's really something we brought up because it's a tool that we can incorporate at multiple moments your student child teen going from one emotion to another i think it's shocking for the parent or whomever they're speaking with it's also probably shocking to that individual as well so allowing space to say Hmm, you know, walk me through maybe what just happened with that emotion shift. Let's explore it together. That's a way to introduce um a way to to encourage positive discussion about the emotional change and get kids more comfortable exploring maybe why that popped up. And if there's no answer at the moment, that's okay. But at least we're starting that behavior of recognizing okay, something changed. Like, maybe I want to self-reflect. Thank you. How do I know the difference between healthy and unhealthy anger? I think we can look back to the signs and behaviors um, that we spoke about earlier in our presentation. I think when you see perhaps things like manifestation of wanting to get into a physical fight with someone or yelling at someone or behavior that 
maybe interpersonal or inflicted on oneself that looks like it's causing harm. I think that's an anger where it might be more on the bad anger side. I think on the good anger side, you can still see things like raising one voice, raising one's voice, but if they're expressing expressing emotions or they're able to vocalize frustrations, it could just be an elevated voice is helping go through those motions of understanding. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So if you're seeing the expression of feelings, why the anger is coming to light, the um you know, the desire to sort of work through that feeling and it manifests as maybe some of that typical anger, that is likely a good type of anger because you're ex you're expressing and you're trying to explore. I think the bad type of anger is when you really see the possibility for the individual to do significant harm to themselves or others, that's when the anger turns a little bit negative. And I think too, like we've talked about through this presentation, um, for parents to help their kids reframe um, instead of that like good or bad anger, um, helpful or unhelpful. Like, is this is this emotion serving us to to get our needs met, or and, and or telling us that there's danger, or telling us that there's something we need to change, um, or is it causing us to have really tough consequences, you know, interpersonally or with our own personal safety? Thank you. And and appreciate the the language shift, right? Because that also helps with the, the mentality shift, the attitude shift. So thank you for that. Um, is anger a sign of mental illness? Every healthy person experiences anger. Um, so I think that it is a part of a pool of emo emotions that make us human beings. Um, and as we've discussed, we don't want to always associate anger that there's this massive problem um, because it's just as valid of a feeling as happiness, as excitement, um, as sadness. And taking the time to reframe that no emotion is bad Um it's more about how they're how they're serving us um, and what they're telling us. Thank you. It, it kind of makes me think of the movie Inside Out. <laughs> Absolutely, a favorite. And I, I and I appreciate that they introduced anxiety. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll do another workshop on that. Um, how do I explain to my child that anger is not a bad feeling and can be used positively, which is kind of in alignment with what we were just saying? Sure. And it it will definitely be helpful to review the content that we had in the slides. Um, it, it gave so many helpful suggestions. So I'm so glad that people, you know, are asking about these things and that's why we're here and um, we're we hope this is helpful. Thank you. Um, a couple more. How can anger affect my child's relationships? So we've talked a lot about consequences. Tara, uh, was there something on your mind? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to talk, yeah, kind of what you were saying about consequences. I think really when we think about anger, and this goes back to healthy versus unhealthy anger, it's how is it affecting those around you and how are the actions you're taking around your anger affecting your relationships? Um, so I think really engaging with your children to even show them moments that you might be angry with them and talking through it in a really healthy way that can be setting and setting an example for them that you can have anger in relationships and it's about how you engage with that anger that really determines if that's going to harm your relationship or not. Um, I think encouraging your kids to talk about moments when they're angry with you, moments when they're angry with their friends, um, but to talk about it and to not react in a way that harms you or um, other individuals that they might have relationships with. That just reminded me too of another 
kind of helpful mindset and language shift when we're talking about these things um, and, and thinking about how emotions might bring about behavior that feels really unexpected um, and reframing emotions that feel expected or unexpected using that language can be really helpful because I I think that everybody's realities and their experiences need to be validated and just because one child might express or react to a situation one way does not mean that everyone has that same experience. Um, so a big part of validating these human emotions that we all feel are framing them in expected or unexpected ways. And and when anger might be a really unexpected emotion to a situation, labeling that for kids and saying like, wow, like your, your anger right now is so unexpected. Like, I'm here for you. What do you need? Um, is, is a lot different than like, why are you doing that? No, don't stop. Um, those sound totally different and make such a difference in the world and experience of a child. Thank you. And I don't know if you have like more examples of that, because there's another question, like, how do I control my child's anger outburst? And so it kind of goes along with like, what in practice can can people say and do to navigate that situation while it's happening like in real time versus like, you know, shifts that happen later, right? Like, okay, I can start changing my language. I can start thinking differently. I can start having these conversations, but like in the moment of anger, like what uh, other tips do you have for parents to support their uh, children? Yeah. And it's such an important question. And I mean, we've all experienced it. Um, if if we've been in in the responsibility of caring for a child or teaching a child. Um, I mean, I've been walking down a New York City sidewalk with a student and they have a big emotion. And what are you supposed to do um, when you're on the subway or when you're um, in your community or in a classroom? And the number one thing really is ensuring physical and and really psychological safety um so your words really impact like that psychological safety of a student um and using what you know about how to keep that child safe is your first priority so as as soon as safety is ensured in whatever way is correct for your setting um after that taking the time to validate that emotion for a child Telling them that, you know, I see you. I see you labeling it. I, I see that you're angry. I know that you're angry because I see that your body is doing X, Y, Z. You could say, I see your hands are clenched. I see that your brows are furrowed and you feel so angry. Um, and just encouraging that labeling in conversation um, can really make kids feel seen. So you can get to that convert, get to that self-regulation because if you're not taking the time to validate before you're helping them calm down it's gonna go nowhere um so it's back to the basics safety and then labeling moving into regulation and communication um so that made me think of a couple of things i have another question but i, I want to ask my question um so I guess my first, the first part is what can families that have students with less language skills do? Because, right, there's also a, a great deal of our population that um, there, there may not be that, that back and forth conversation, that ability for reciprocal communication. So how then, um, like what tools or what, uh, what things can families implement if they have a student that that is less able to engage in that talking type of um, scenario, and and like what in that moment then can they can families do to right to calm right? Because if you're validating, then the the alternative I would assume would then be like how do we calm like get calm to a place where we can try to communicate in whatever way that's that the student can but like what what are some other tools if if talking is not the primary um, modality for communication um with the family yeah it's a really important question um 
the first thing that comes to mind is it's it's going to be a really individualized approach and that's where like understanding your relationship with the child if you're a teacher um or as a parent n- taking time to explore is it that they need a comfort item is it that they need a fidget or a distraction um do they need assistive technology or do they have access to any kind of technology that helps them communicate which isn't always the case um so really exploring what's available to you and what motivates the child or comforts them to you know to have a shift in behavior um i know not not all children like like to be touched but sometimes teaching um some of that progressive muscle relaxation that we talked about, like you could teach a child to like give a squeeze on a wrist um, rather than giving them a hug. Um, so there's there's so many of these little approaches and it really just depends on the individual person and there's no one size fits all answer. Did you have any ideas, Edie? Um, one thing that I think has helped a lot in in my work in schools is introducing breathing exercises as a personal way to just really try to lower that heart rate and just refocus yourself. Um, So if that's something that your child or your student or whomever you're with is comfortable doing, or you feel it's safe for them to practice, um, there's a technique called box breathing in which you inhale for three seconds, you hold that for three seconds, you exhale for three seconds and then you kind of hold that for three seconds. So if you, you think about a box, um, if you do that, you know, maybe four to five times, you can really bring that heart rate down and start to feel a bit more in control. Um, so if you have a student or a child that isn't interested in speaking or is not at that developmental level too, that's perfectly fine. There are other ways to sort of recenter and lower that heart rate, which we find can often, if it's too elevated, can really make it difficult to feel like you're in control of anything. Um, I completely agree with Marie's uh, recommendation for an anchoring item. Sometimes it's just nice to feel something else. Um, like the world isn't swallowing you whole, we can sort of translate our emotions into this item and just, again, feel as if we're a bit more centered. Um, If you're in your home environment, an emotions poster is great. Um, Some of them are a little silly looking, some of them are fun, but seeing emotional cues can help us recognize in ourselves what's going on. So if it's a tool that a child uses to point to, okay, we're recognizing that emotion and we're validating it. We don't always have to sit down and talk. There are other ways to achieve the same goal in different formats. Yeah. And something you said was reminding me there's, there's so many fun deep breaths that you can use with kids. And when you teach them a variety of them and give them some agency of choice, um, they absolutely love it. So uh, um, an example of some that we would give kids choices to do is it would sound like, do you want to do a rainbow deep breath or a lion deep breath or a hot chocolate deep breath? Um, and giving them that kind of this or that decision can help them to um, feel a little more in control when that might not be the case. Um, A lot of the things we're talking about too relate back to the social thinking curriculum. And I know that there's a lot of social thinking resources for parents on their website. Uh, That's another good place to look. Thank you. Um, Can you get therapy for anger issues? And if so, what is the best therapy you can get? Or what are, I, I'm going to amend that to what are different kinds because therapy is individualized. Sure, yeah. And, there, and there's a variety of behavioral health um, approaches. I think like the most basic and um, one that kind of focuses on your thoughts, feelings and behaviors is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a, a very common approach. Um, 
if emotions are really big and and safety is also a concern again depending on you know the cognitive ability for a child to participate um dbt um, or dialectical behavior therapy can be really helpful we had some resources um on our website there um but yeah I, i really think like cognitive behavioral therapy is a good place to start, but any practitioner that you go to usually will, in their assessment, help you decide um, or or share with you what they think based on your individual circumstance. So as a parent, know that it's less on you to to make that decision. Rely on your clinicians and trust their judgment um, based on their recommendations. And you can always try something for you or your child. And if it doesn't work out, that's a conversation that you can have with with your provider. And um, if they can't pivot, they'll refer you to some something better. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that concludes our questions for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation on anger management for teens. Special thank you to our presenters, Marie, Edie, and Tara from Fordham University for leading this webinar on such an important topic. We encourage our audience to please complete our survey that has been shared via link in the chat. Our friends at Fordham have also shared a survey on the screen. Um, It would be really great if you did both um, because they really help us. Surveys are super important and they support our work as agencies and organizations. They help us target our workshops, let us know how we're doing and, and guide our planning so that we can do more of what you need. So we truly appreciate it. If you took a moment to please complete our surveys, um, there's a link in the chat and then there's a one on the screen. And if anyone has any questions um, or if you have a question for the presenter or you'd like to um, reach out to them, you can let me know and I will facilitate connecting you with them. Uh, thank you again to everyone that has joined us today and have a wonderful rest of your day. And thank you to our interpreter. So we'll give everyone one minute with the link open. You can click in the chat and then we'll close out the webinar. Thank you and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Rima. Thanks all. Thank you, ladies. You have a good one. Adios, Mark. Thank you. All right. So I'll be closing out the platform now. Thank you, everybody. Um, again, we have a participant that said thank you in the Q&A. And um, have a wonderful weekend. Stay warm. Bye. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to Bye. meet you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.